Actually, my uh, title, as best I can remember it, uh, was uh, Progress Towards Practical Energy. Anyway, that's, that, that's what I'm going to talk about. Uh, uh, could I uh, have the first slide, please? Can you see that? Can I see it? Can I get away from here? Seeing that, but I hope you can see it. Thank you. All right. Okay. okay. Uh, here uh, you see the reaction which goes most. I should say also, it, that isn't really showing the whole slide, uh, and that may be troublesome for future slides that the top and bottom has been cut off. But anyway, let me proceed. What you see here is the warm fusion reaction rate, which goes most rapidly, namely uh, deuterium with tritium. It makes uh, helium. About 20% of the energy goes into the helium nucleus. It makes a neutron. The neutron is very handy because tritium does not exist in nature, and so this neutron hitting the lithium blanket allows us to breathe back the tritium. To get the reaction to go, it requires some hundreds of millions of degrees or tens of kilo electron volts. That is up a factor of a thousand or more from chemical energies, but fortunately it is still down by a factor of a thousand from nuclear energies, and so there's a gain to be made by fusing uh, these hot uh, nuclei. That gain is made all the greater because of the 20% of the energy that goes into the alpha particle, because that can be captured in a fuel and can be used to keep everything warm. So by and by, this stuff can burn without any need for input of power from the outside and lots of power coming out, and that is called ignition. Next slide. Aside from uh, burning deuterium and tritium, one can also burn deuterium straight, and you'll be hearing more about this today. That's a little bit harder to do for hot fusion, but not much harder. One can also burn D-helium-3, which has the merit that uh, only charged particles come off so that radioactivity uh, is diminished. Next slide. We don't need this, I think. Uh, now, uh, let me talk a little bit about the approaches to uh, hot fusion. One of them is called inertial confinement. It's sort of a little bomb, a very small one, a few millimeters across. You heat the surface with an intense heat source, such as a laser or x-rays or particle beam. You blow the surface off and the inside recoils and collapses, goes to extremely high density and high temperature and ignites. And if you're fortunate, it gives you back 100 times more energy than you put in. This work is being done in a number of places, notably uh, in Livermore on the Nover, with considerable success. In addition, uh, the newspapers tell us that in underground work, uh, real ignition has already been achieved along this line. So it appears quite hopeful. Next slide. Let me now talk about the work that we're engaged. No, this is uh, NOVA, the business end, the chamber, and feeding into that is a very large building full of uh, laser energy uh, going uh, in. Next slide. Switching now to when we're working on a Princeton, so-called magnetic fusion. There, we don't make little explosions. We try to hold things in steady state. We take advantage of the fact that matter becomes ionized at a mere 10,000 degrees. The charged electrons and nuclei then cannot move freely across the magnetic field. And we hope to keep them stuck inside a torus of magnetic field. It isn't nearly as easy as it looks. 
because uh, the particles drive the damnedest to escape. Next slide. Here is uh, the largest uh, toroidal confinement apparatus in the United States, the TFDR at Princeton. The torus is buried inside there. These boxes shoot in tens of megawatts of neutral atom beams to heat up the plasma. Next slide. Now, typically, oh, focus, please. Typically, what one tries to do in these experiments is one works with deuterium, precisely because it is less reactive, and so all those neutrons aren't so much of a nuisance. And one tries to maximize the fusion reactions and minimize the heat loss from these very hot plasmas to the surroundings. Typically, we are achieving in the laboratory temperatures of hundreds of millions of degrees, and we would like not to waste too much power keeping the plasma hot. So, starting from the famous T3 tokamak experiment about 20 years ago, which was a vast success for that time, one is pushed upward to machines like TFDR and the European version of it, uh, JET. And what is plotted here is the projected fusion energy release relative to the uh, plasma heat loss. Projected means projected for deuterium tritium, where we imagine we substitute a 50-50 DT mixture for the deuterium, and thereby get about 300 times more power out. Now, a magic number is when that ratio equals five, because then the alpha particles of the DT reaction are suffice to keep the plasma hot, and then you have reached ignition. And so we are currently proposing to build a new machine that will run in the, in the United States. On the way to that point, there is break even, where at least you make as much fusion power out as heating power goes in. And we are pretty close to that now on TFDR, and are confident this can be reached. Next slide. Now, in the case of uh, the dawn of fission power, for instance, you may remember that Enrico Fermi did that in a quite modest installation. And when he got first power appearing, you know, it was about a third of a watt. The approach here is different. We're having a hard struggle getting to break even, where the heat insulation is good enough so that the fusion power equals the heating power. But the power levels are already quite high. So that, for instance, in the actual deuterium burning experiments in TFDR, we're making a lot of reactions, uh, seven times 10 to the 16th. Even if you divide that by the volume, which is three times 10 to the seventh, that's a lot of reactions per cubic centimeter. And that is 40,000 real watts of fusion power being made. Of course, a lot more power going in to heat the plasma. If we were to substitute deuterium tritium, that would go directly to 12 megawatts. And our goal for this machine is 40 megawatts. The next generation machine, the ignition machine, will have the same physical size and will make 400 megawatts. So one point I would like to make is while warm fusion, in a sense, has a long way to go still, or some ways to go, to get to ignition, once it's there, it will already be at a very high power level. And a second point is that uh, it is this kind of high power level that sets the size of any power source. The magnetic fusion reactors that are projected are very big because they aim to make 1,000 megawatts electric or something of that sort. And if you compare that with coal-fired plants or any other plant that makes that kind of power, it is also very big. And I think that will be true no matter what the fusion source is. By the time you scale it up to make thousands of megawatts, it's going to be big. So that is not a peculiarity at all of magnetic fusion. It's a peculiarity of generating lots of power. Next slide. 